Hello everybody and welcome back. My name is Gavin and this is my channel. Thank you very much for checking me out. Today's video is a little bit of a departure for what, from what I have been doing. I have this idea for a project. It's actually not my original idea. It's my wife's idea, but uh, which is a terrific idea. And that is to create what I'm calling like a true crime video encyclopedia just a place where we can go back and refer to different phrases or keywords or technologies within the true crime genre. And today I'm going to start off with covering DNA and how it is used in forensics. Now, if you, I know that most of us have heard the term DNA and we know on maybe a not so profound level, at least I'm probably just describing myself what DNA is. Um, we know that it's our genetic makeup or we know that we all have it and we know that we pass it down from generation to generation, but I want to maybe not get into the scientific who's and what's and how's and why's of DNA. If you want to do that, you want to learn, you know, the basics of what DNA is, I would suggest a channel called Stated Clearly. There are two videos that they have done that I absolutely love. One called What is DNA and How Does It Work? And the other called What is a Chromosome? Now, I am going to uh, take what I've learned from those videos and apply it to also what I've learned within forensics and investigations, okay? So um, if you like this kind of video, please, please subscribe please like it. And if you don't like it, please give me a thumbs down so that I know what kind of content you guys want from me. Okay. So, um, let's just go ahead and get into this. We don't need to belabor it very long. What is DNA? Um, first of all, DNA is, oh, it's hard for me to pronounce, uh, deoxyribonucleic acid. <laughs> That's what it stands for. Basically, DNA is a molecule that contains the genetic code of all organisms. And that is whether you are a human, whether you are uh, an animal, a plant, anything that is an organism, it has DNA. Um, within the human family, close to 99.9% .9 of the DNA that we all have is identical. Um, which actually, you know, not to get on too far on a tangent here, but when you learn that, maybe we can start to think about how the differences that we have are really minor, right? Just speaking societally, when it comes to humankind, we all share most of our DNA. And the DNA is held in the nucleus of cells and it is organized, I'm, I'm just gonna use these terms loosely, it's organized in chromosomes. Um, let, me, uh, let me go, oh, now a chromosome, basically if you take the DNA and it's a long strand, uh, you wrap them around these little spheric things called histones, and then you stack those all together, it becomes a chromosome. Now, the reason that chromosomes exist in the first place is because um, the DNA strands are so long that they really, they don't fit very well. And so inside the nucleus of a cell. And so when a cell is getting ready to uh, separate, to, to replicate itself, um, the DNA, which is kind of loosely floating in the nucleus, will will tighten up into those chromosomal packages, I guess is what I want to want to call them. OK, um, and then from there, uh, let me see what I got. Basically, this this is a photo of all of the chromosomes that we have in our body in the human organism there are actually 46 chromosomes. I know that most of us just kind of think of our X and Y chromosome and, but those are really the, those are the last pair that uh, determine one's sex. Everything else uh, has nothing to do with one's sex. And what they do is they, they've ordered them from one to 22 in order of size. It's kind of a, kind of a funny thing, but that is what, our chromosomes uh, look like, I guess, on a macro scale. As you get deeper down in there, of course, uh, you'll see different things. Now, um, let's kind of take a look at what D how DNA is structured. DNA, as we all know, is in this uh, double helical um, ladder. Now, um, 
the kind of the the sides of the ladder are made up of a sugar phosphate and uh, the rungs of the ladder are are created by what are called nucleobases and when they are connected to the sides they call them nucleotides um, when when you then basically what they do is they bond together uh, with a hydrogen bond. Now you'll see that these um, nucleobases are labeled with a letter A, T, G, C. Uh, and you'll see the A's and T's tend to go together and uh, G's and C's tend to go together. Um, now those that A, G, T, C, A, T, G, C, whatever you want to call it, is kind of important. It's a label that scientists put on it because uh, it, the new or the I guess chemical structure of C is cytosine, G is guanine, uh, A is adenine, and uh, T is thymine. Now, um, the reason that these for forensic for our purposes, the reason that these are important will become very very clear. But uh, you know when we put them together, these uh, these bases. Basically, in the human organism, we have about 3 billion base pairs, okay, which is kind of important for us to know. So there are quite a lot of base pairs of, um, <laughs> of, these, of these parts of DNA. So it is very large, it's very complex, and, but for the most part, it's 99.9% .9 the same in all. All of us and where we get differences are in what are called mutations so if we were to take this uh, CGAT here and um, we were to take half of this helix the double helix and we were to map out you know uh, in a typewritten form the code it would look something like this okay but it would be millions and millions and billions of characters long. In forensics, uh, basically what, well, well, I'll get into that, okay. So in forensics, what they're doing is they're looking for what are called short tandem repeats. Now, because close to 99.9% .9 of our DNA is identical, they're looking for mutations that are unique to each person. And so what they do is they look for repeated phrases within this genetic code. And um, they, they look at them in specific locations, which they call loci, all right? So in order to match one sample of DNA to another, the repeats of those letters in the specific, within that specific location, they must match. So if we, um, so if we, if we look at this right here, uh, we'll look into this a little bit more, but there are repeats that we can take a look at. Okay. Now, um, and then what they do when they, when they do the STR, um, analysis, they in, then upload it to a database, which was created and is maintained by the FBI uh, called CODIS, which stands for Combined DNA Index System. This system is actually pretty old. It was established in 94. Uh, it has a standardized structure and it originated with 13 core locations where they're looking for that, for those, um, that STR, right? Those repeats. So uh, that has been expanded over time to 20 core loci. Um, okay, so this is the original CODIS 13 core loci. And um, basically these, uh, these alphanumeric uh, labels are known areas of the um, of the chromosome. So when we're looking at all of our chromosomes, we're looking at the first pair, second pair, third pair, and so on and so forth. And because they're looking for one location in a pair of chromosomes, there will be what they call two alleles. And that, that becomes important. Now, um, many of these um, lo locations um, in the different chromosomes are, are labeled like TPOX. Uh, some of them are labeled D is in Delta and then the name or the number of the chromosome and then S is in Sierra and then a numeric location of, 
of that loc locus, right? So, um, so you will see 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. And then they uh, take a look at our XY chromosomes to determine whether the DNA sample that they're looking at is from a male or a female. So um, when we go back to looking at this text right here and we start to uh, see uh, some repeats, right? I've highlighted them in yellow here, right here. This repeat is CTA, CTA, CTA. This repeat is AGC, 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 so forth, ATA, ATA, ATA. Now, um, sometimes they're looking for repeats of three digits, sometimes four digits, sometimes five, well, I shouldn't say digits, uh, characters, right? But the the key that we need to know is that they're looking for these repeats. Okay. So in, in this case, um, like this one right here has three repeats of three characters. And so this one has five and this one has three. And so when they look at that, those different loci within our genetic makeup amongst all the different chromosomes, once you have 13, 15, 17, 20 of those uh, to take a look at, you can start to, when you compare DNA comparisons, you can start to create statistical matches. Okay. So um, STRs uh, are very good for forensic investigations because it's a standardized location that they're comparing when you have DNA of two or more samples. And I'm going to show you uh, you know, some of, some of these reports. Okay. Um, the thing about STRs though, is with just the information on the 13 to 20 core CODIS loci, you really can't determine a genetic relationship between two DNA samples because the data are quite limited. So most of the time for genetic genealogy, there have to be two tests. And most companies who do genetic genealogy, they use a system called single nucleotide polymorphism and uh, they call that SNP. Okay. And I'm going to get into why that's important, but let's take a look at how, uh, how these reports come back. Okay. So, uh, this locus right here, D eight S one, one seven, nine, which is one of the standard loci, you will see that they have found right here, a repeat of whatever that digit is 13 times. Okay. And here they have found a, a D two. Uh, D21 S11, they found it 30 times. And over here, you'll find that there are actually two repeats because remember, each chromosome is a pair. So sometimes they will be able to find one repeat pattern on one of the chromosomes. Uh, maybe the other chromosome, the allele just isn't strong enough in the sample. And then sometimes they'll find two. And really what you'd want to see is two in the, in the match. Okay. So this right here is then once they have done that, they will put it into a report that just, it looks like a spreadsheet like this. Now this, um, this report specifically comes off of, um, the investigation of Amanda Winkowski where they had, um, an oral swab where they found a uh, sperm. They found, uh, they had another oral swab. They had a vaginal swab where they found sperm. Um, and then another vaginal swab, another rectal swab, and then a swab of the right leg, and then a swab of a broken earring that was with her. And then what they've done is these two columns have known DNA samples from their persons of interest. So in this case, what, what investigators did is they went to Antoine Garner, Adam Patterson requested a DNA sample. They usually swab, it's a buckle swab, so swab the inside of the cheek. And uh, then they're going to compare these to, uh, to the rest of everything. So you will see that in this oral swab, they actually found one, two, three, four, five different um, STRs, right? Repeats. So, and, and why would they find five repeats? Well, what that means is that there are mul there's DNA from multiple people from that sample is, is what that means. So, um, 
you know, in uh, at D21 S11, for example, they found 27, 28, and 30.2. So they found three. Now, then what they will do is they will, let, let's take D8 S1179. We've got an 8, a 10, 11, 13, and 14. Now, these double asterisks mean that it's a weaker allele, but, um, but then if we go over to the known buckles, 11 and 14, we can find 11 and 14 here. And then 8 and 13, we can find 8 and 13 here. So at least at this locus, um, the DNA found on the oral swab matches Antoine Garner and Adam Patterson. And as we go down the line, let's take a look at D21, S11, 27, 28, and 30.2. Over here, we've got uh, 29, 30, and 27, and 30.2. So it is not a match to Antoine Garner, but it is a match to Adam Patterson. If we go to D7 S820, we'll find 10, and both Antoine Garner and Adam Patterson have 10. So that is a partial match on one of the chromosomal pairs, and so on and so forth. Now, once we get down to, um, if we get down to this line, then uh, they will, they can tell that this is an XY. So, um, basically what they what they found here when you look at the report is that there was there was multiple there were multiple people who had who put sperm into Amanda Winkowski's mouth so um that's what that's what that looks like now when i was investigating the Amanda Winkowski case i got a a message a facebook message from somebody who said hey i'm a genetic genealogist can you, since you have DNA, can you send me the DNA and I will upload it to GEDmatch and I will see if I can find somebody who is closely related to the DNA here. Now, um, I was excited about that and I wanted to give it to her, but um, I reached out to my friend. Well, when I gave it to her, she's like, I don't understand what this is. And that is because she had never seen DNA shown like this before. Uh, so, um, so let's get into SNPs, okay? The single nu nucleotide, nucleotide polymorphism, they are the most common type of genetic variation among people. So this is actually, this, this bullet right here is taken directly from 23andMe. It says, to make new cells, an existing cell divides in two, but first it copies its DNA so the new cells will each have a complete set of genetic instructions. Cells sometimes make mistakes during the copying process, kind of like typos. And these typos lead to variations in the DNA sequence at particular locations. This is called a SNP. So a SNP is, a, is basically a typo in your genetic code. And so when you get your DNA done from 23andMe, what they will do, you'll get a report that looks like this, that is hundreds of thousands of lines that have different RSIDs at different positions in your genetic makeup. And it'll tell you on, on each of the chromosomal pairs, what it is a T on this case, on one of the pair, one of the chromosome one pairs, it's a T on the other, it's a T and then so on and so forth, a G G G G G and, and so on and so forth. So, um, and it'll be sometimes hundreds of thousands or even a million uh, lines long, these reports. So I guess what I'm trying to, to show to you is that the SNPs, because they have a wide data set on each person, then they are able to go in and say, okay, people from this continent tend to have you know, this value at this SNP. And people who have brown hair tend to have this value and this value at these SNPs. People who are short, so on and so, people who tend to have cancer, they, they have all these genetic markers. And so what we're doing in forensics with the STR is very different than what we're doing in genetic genealogy with the, with the SNP system. Uh, let me... Let me go back over to, to here. Okay. So while, so even having said that though, both are useful in criminal investigations. Okay. So STRs are used to compare known samples to match DNA collected from a crime scene to a criminal in the CODIS database. 
And then SNPs are used in genetic genealogy. And that's not to say the STRs are not used in genetic genealogy, just to make it simple for us to understand. SNPs are used to find relatives of a person whose DNA was collected at the crime scene. And STRs and SNPs, the thing about them is they require two different tests. And so if you don't have very much genetic material, um, you may only be able to do one test and it's getting better over time. They're able to use less and less genetic material in order to do these tests because they can amplify that DNA. Um, but typically speaking, law enforcement agencies will, um, oh, what's happening here? Yeah. Law enforcement agencies will, um, they will tend to do the STR and upload to CODIS to see if there's a match that, and then what I have seen from other, uh, well, from some law enforcement agencies, they will say, well, we can't run the second one because we don't have enough genetic material or we don't have um, the budget to do a SNP test, those kinds of things. So guys, that is the, I guess, the rundown of DNA used in forensics. Obviously, this is taught by a lay person and <laughs> I'm not sure that I've got it exactly right, but I think that I do. And I hope that you enjoyed this video. Um, so come on back to it anytime you need a refresher course on how DNA is used in crime scene investigations. And uh, if you like this video, please give it a thumbs up, like I said before. And if you don't like it, please go ahead and give it a thumbs down so that I know and I won't be uh, wasting my time and yours doing videos like this one. If you like this kind of content, you want to see more of it, please subscribe. And if you'd like to support me in a monetary way, uh, please head over to my Patreon. I've left a link link down in the description. All right, guys, with that, I will bid you adieu and I will see you the next time. Take care. Thank you very much for watching this video. If you liked what you saw, please subscribe to my channel. And if you have any comments or questions, please leave them below.